Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another podcast. Today, I'm with Irene from The Thought Spot, a channel that I have been watching. Actually, I think because my audience recommended it to me. I'm almost positive. And now I am hooked and I'm so excited <laughs> we've connected. It just makes yeah. me so happy. I've really enjoyed your last few videos, especially the one about anger. So I'm excited to talk to you about that today. How me are too. we? I'm doing pretty good. I have my water, my coffee, my notebook in case I forget anything, jot down my random thoughts. So we're good to go. Same. I also have my notebook because I do have some notes written down, but I know as you're talking, I'm going to, some more are going to come. So I also have my notebook. Um, I'm excited to talk about anger because I know depending on your cultural background, the bubble you were born into, your personal relationship with it, anger is either something as simple as like a little emotion or it's something that everyone's afraid of or it's something that's encouraged or it's, you know, everyone's having a different relationship with it. I thought we could start off with that. What is your relationship with anger? Hmm. On a personal level? Mm. Um, I feel like up until recently and for many years now, I didn't really have a relationship to anger. I think for the longest time, I've developed a lot of coping mechanisms and behaviors that is contingent to suppressing anger. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I got to a point where I can kind of extract information that anger gives you without actually expressing it which is a lot. Um, I feel like that process takes a lot longer than if you were to simply express it and feel it. So what that would look like is, I guess for the past couple years, if I ever felt anger, I would kind of go isolate hmm. for however long I needed um, just to get some space away from the person or the situation um, and just process all of it intellectually without feeling anything that is associated to it. Um, and I oftentimes wouldn't even know how to understand what I was going through or how to respond until let's say months later after kind of just going through many, many months of brain fog and a sense of numbness. Yeah. Um, and I just feel like recently, given my relationships with people in general right now in my life, it, suppressing that anger has been getting a lot harder and harder. And there were moments where I felt like it was hard to suppress it altogether. Mm -hmm. And so I had to find ways to navigate it. And I think it's helpful that this past year, do you hear that truck? Who cares, girl? It's life. Okay. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> I feel like this past year, I've been trying to feel my feelings more instead mm. of intellectualizing things. Yeah. So doing a lot of things associated with my body and releasing um, emotions or memories that are stored inside of me. And I think a part of that is naturally also feeling anger when it comes up and mm. finding ways to actually release it without feeling ashamed about it or feeling like I'm being irrational. Um, and again, it's going to be different for everyone because other people might hear that and be like, well, it's not okay to yell at someone or punch them. Mm. That's not what I'm talking about. Right. For me, I would never do that regardless. It's more of like, if I'm angry, even if I'm on my own, I let myself actually release it on my own mm. in a healthy way where it doesn't harm another person. You know what? So, okay. You said so many things. I have so many notes already. Um, there. There's this like a uh, oh which one do I start with the relationship we have with anger is so interesting because I was raised in like this household that I think l preferred anger over mm -hmm. crying like you were allowed to cry you were allowed to be angry but I think like crying was bullied more than anger and I think we saw anger as sort of a stoicism which is ironic because like stoicism is about having a balanced relationship a discipline and relationship with your emotions not being angry. And there's this phenomenon you talked about in your video about anger where you said like sometimes you'd go silent or calmer while people would get louder. And this is a phenomenon I see in myself and I kind of see it as like a benefit in some ways because it allows me to be like the calm one when everything is going wrong. But also when I was younger, 
I have a distinct memory of my mother having like an upset moment. She's very angry and she's crying and she's just like very upset with me. And I'm like a teenager, young, maybe an older teenager. I can't remember. And she's like pleading with me. And I go into what my sister would refer to as my doctor house mode, my sociopath mode, where I would just like be very logical and rational and intellectualize everything and like let go of my emotions. But I wasn't letting go. I was suppressing them. I wasn't actually engaging with myself. I was denying myself so I could be in control of the situation. So it's interesting sort of like when I see people being upset how when I grew up being told like anger was better because anger somehow like motivated you more, which reminds me of like Eminem or, you know, he talks a lot about how anger was his motivator or even athletes, how they use anger as like a motivation. And I wonder how many people find that anger can be a great motivator for success or how many people are successful because they're angry at someone or they're bullies or the people that hurt them. So I wonder if anger as a tool is actually just more beneficial in a um, monetary sense, in a like materialistic sense versus like crying can be like cathartic and more introspective. You know, what do you think about that? I think it all depends on what your intention is. If your intention is to shape your life around money, anything could be used for monetary gain, even crying. True. I mean, how many people do you see um, – monetizing their emotions like filming themselves crying true, or true, true. you know depression and things like that mm. I think anger is definitely a tool I just feel like society doesn't know how to utilize anger yet um in a healthy way I feel like we tend to use anger to take it out on each other because mm. it's a very personal and emotional experience when anger, I think, is simply just it could just be a sense of drive or inspiration or even competitiveness, which doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing. I think these are all things that are so necessary for everyone, no matter where you come from, what age you are, or what gender you are, and things like that. And in a sense, I feel like men as a whole, if we're talking about binary genders, has more or less found ways to live with anger a lot more fluently than women have, mm. um, which is why stereotypically men have... I guess if I were to define masculine energy, it would be like things in the physical world, like setting goals, achieving it, making sure the physical realm is taken care of in every sense. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like women are finally catching up because we're allowed a space and opportunity to, I guess, have more masculine energy and do more masculine things. But I still feel like that anger part isn't something that we have been navigating as much as I would like to see, I feel like I've seen essences of it in certain movements, like feminism, for example. But I almost feel like I would like to see that anger kind of get to a point where it's more refined, if that makes sense, and directed in a way that isn't so interpersonal, but more so, I mean, honestly, anger, any emotion we feel, but in this case, anger is not necessarily about another person. It's about yourself. Mm. Um, but I feel like people usually when they feel anger, it's very closely associated to this person is making me angry. And I wouldn't have ever felt this if it wasn't for you, mm. you know, mm -hmm. and that's complex because it's like the anger and whatever ignited it is already in you regardless of that person it's just they for whatever reason were able to activate that inside of you interesting you know? i read i i i uh was reading this article about like perceptions of different genders in terms of like anger and when women like women even other women don't like anger in women mm -hmm. 
And actually I was researching it for my own self because I was making content and I was like, who do I appeal to? Like, what's my vibe? And I found that my category of women, woman is actually less attractive to both women and men because they, even though people like anger in men, they don't seem to like it in women and even domineering or assertiveness, they don't like it in women as much as they like it in men. And I wonder about that. Like I really do because I see it in women like assertiveness or dominant dominant like personality traits or even anger. And I'm like, oh, interesting. I don't think anything of it. But in but for some reason, the general populace, I suppose, is having a negative reaction to it. And I wonder where that comes from and why in men does it feel so good. And I wonder if it's just like that typical assumption that like leaders are allowed to be angry and women aren't leaders. Like I wonder if it's internalized misogyny or if it's something biological, if it's something inherent to like how people perceive each other. I'm not sure, but it's interesting to know that that's a phenomenon that's happening amongst the species. And I'm curious like what that will mean in 50 years, because I know in some places I, I see a lot of women in myself included who try to mimic men because as a working woman, like I'm in a man's world, but at the, even in streaming, I was at Disneyland last year before I came here actually. And someone came up to me and was like, oh my God, are you Brittany Simon? And I was like, yeah, that's me. And like, it was so sweet. And they were like, it's really nice having a woman in the commentary space. And I was like, oh, that's me. I'm a woman in the commentary space. And then even recently, I've been covering a lot of drama and people are like, it's so nice to hear a woman's perspective. And I'm like, yeah, a woman. And like, I forget that people are perceiving me as a woman in a man's space. Because I just keep thinking I'm a content creator, but it's true. Like I am technically one of the few women in the commentary space. And mm -hmm. so I have to like recontextualize my own relationship with how I react when I get angry on stream, when I play it up a little bit, when I'm enhancing sort of my exaggeration. You've seen me, I'm a very exaggerated, like I exaggerate a lot. But I noticed that when I go off on stream, people either love it, like my audience either loves it, but the people perceiving me will see me do the same thing a man will do. But in the man, the anger is attractive. But in me, it's like, oh, she's lost it. So like anger in men looks like a sense of control while women, when they express anger, might look like, quote, hysteria. Yeah. Which I think is just like a fascinating, like it's almost like society is telling on itself. You know, because they're seeing mm. the same emotion, but because of the gender, they're seeing it yeah. and perceiving it differently, which I just think is fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with just how we are taught to be responsible for each other as mm. humans and as a community. Um, for decades and generations, I think it's normal to have to carry the weight of men's emotions, even outside of anger, but anger included, and process it for them and nurture them through it. And the roles haven't ever been there to support that same exchange towards women. And so I think a lot of, I mean, these are all my opinions and I'm just externally processing. I'm not saying it's necessarily true, but I feel like people don't necessarily they're not used to doing that for women. Mm. Um, being able to hold space and process a woman's anger or her rage. Um, and granted, I think it's it's not as simple as that. It's like a whole full circle thing. Like, I do think a lot of women, because they haven't had safe spaces to express anger, I feel like our anger isn't necessarily healthy either when we do express it. Um, and so it makes it even harder and it enables that mindset of like that aversion towards anger. So like when a woman does finally express anger, it's just really intense and it, mm. it encompasses more than just the situation at hand. It's like usually like a bunch of experiences compounding to a breaking point. Yeah, yeah. And it, it creates a dynamic where even if the other person cares about you or respect you, it's like, whoa, this is a lot. And I don't know how. I feel like people's reactions are usually like, how is this going to affect, affect me? Like, how do I need to show up for you right now? And am I willing to do that? And usually I think people have aversions to women feeling angry because they realize they don't want to carry that weight, you know? Mm. It's interesting. I got this feedback once 
uh, from a couple of men who were like, I don't like when you're angry at me. And I was like, what? And they're like, when you're angry at me, it feels more judgmental than when a man is angry at me. And I was like, oh, huh. I, I don't know if you're saying that you uh, value my opinion more <laughs> or if you're saying that I am literally judging you harsher than a man would judge you, which a part of me is wondering, like, there's so much to unpack there alone, like to get the feedback that like, I don't like when you're angry at me. And I wonder if it is a combination of those things. Do men pedestal women's opinions more, but secretly or like secretly, do they do that more, but then they don't say it in public? Or are they saying that women are actually holding them more accountable than their ca male counterparts? And so when that anger is expressed, does it coincide with judgment? Like that's really hard for me to understand is anger judgment. And I would say like contextually sometimes, you know? Mm. Hmm. I feel like anger can instill fear in the other person sometimes because it's usually associated to action mm. even when there's no it, like it's not a negative thing i feel like anger the energy in and of itself is action oriented that's the purpose of anger like if you think about it right more than any other emotion that we feel anger is the one that is usually always associated to some form of doing something about it, whether that's like physical, you know, fighting someone off or whatever, defending yourself or running, or like some people channel it in a competitive sense in like yeah. sports or um, fitness. Um, anger, I feel like doesn't usually happen without action being associated to it if that makes sense and so Absolutely. i feel like i feel like something that i felt when you were sharing that about men feeling um i guess i don't know if scared's the right word but this aversion to your anger because there's this judgment associated to it i think it's the underlying fear is like, what are you going to do about this? And mm. how am I going to be affected? And how, what if I'm going to lose anything in this exchange moving forward because you're angry at me? Because anger, I mean, if you think about a judgment, anger and judgment, judgment is also associated to some form of action because it, 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 all of it, those mechanisms kind of show that you're thinking about something, but with the intention of like, it's not working out, mm. you know? So there, it, that usually is followed up by doing something about it or making a decision and things like that. I wonder if it's like, if it translates to like a, like you said, almost like a punishment, whether it's a physical punishment. So sometimes we associate like the angry man with physical punishment, like he might hit me. But then maybe the angry woman is like, she might say something about me. And I think those can be both scary realities for people. And I'm thinking about like, I was like physically disciplined as a child growing up. That was like a norm in our household growing up. And definitely over the years, I think my parents started to realize like, oh, maybe this isn't the best expression of discipline. Not that they would ever say that out loud or admit it, you know, being, I think like, the joke is like they would say, oh, like because they're immigrants from Iraq, they'd say like your grandpa hit me over the head with a brick. You're lucky I only spanked you. And I'm like, uh-huh. And then like moving forward, I think it was about the age I was like 15 or 16. I think that's about the time my parents, my dad specifically stopped like hitting the kids. And it was never like hitting the kids calling CPS status, but it was always like inappropriate because I think it came from a place of wanting to help, but like also anger. Frustration, yeah. mostly. I think frustration turned to anger. You know, like, I'm so at my wits end with you. Like, just do this. Or do you know those memes of the dad trying to do math with their kids and, like, they're slamming the kid on the table? And it's like that – I saw that growing up. We're like, why is my dad so angry over math? Like, what is happening? And a part of it is that, you know, this this ironic, like, um, this there's, like, these bubbles that say – um. Like, why aren't the teachers doing all the work? Why do the parents have to help with homework? Or, oh, why are the teachers getting involved? The parents should do it all. And it's, I think it comes down to the reason, like, your parents don't become teachers because the amount of patience you have to have to teach kids math <laughs> is 
is amazing. And so when parents are put into situations where they feel so outside of their scope of understanding, I think the frustration turns to anger. And I think so when you grow up watching that display of anger, when you have an association with like your parents' footsteps and you're like, oh, like I can tell if I'm in trouble by how fast someone's walking or mm -hmm. like what's the sound of a – like a different like footstep tells me like, oh, 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 or you have to act differently. It's like for good or bad, these are lessons you learn as a child. You pick up the world around you like what kind of anger is safe anger and what kind of anger is bad anger? You know, mm -hmm. like I had neighbors who were Lebanese and they're so funny and they would yell at each other at the top of their lungs, but they never got physical. And mm -hmm. I would hang out there all the time as a kid with my besties and we'd all hang out, you know, because we're all the same age. And cops would get called. Like the neighbors would call the cops on them. And I was like, why are you calling the cops on them? They're like, they must be getting physical because no one yells like that without getting physical. And I was like, oh, they've never gotten physical. It's all – it's just all verbal. So you need to relax. And they're not even yelling about anything important. It's like video games or a disagreement. Like I, I can't even tell you how harmless it was. It just sounded scary. Yeah. So then the irony is like sometimes I think like anger is like accelerated frustration. And then the question is like what relationship are we having with that anger? My Lebanese friends yelling, no big deal. A parent yelling at a kid over math, much bigger deal because it, it – it, it, translates so many other things than just like your friends arguing over video games like this has to do with the parental figure interacting with the child who's also frustrated they can't understand the math mm -hmm. and so that sets a precedent for like what is safety what is expectation oh and what am i gonna earn or what is the, going to be the result of my failure mm -hmm. am i gonna be yelled at am i gonna wwe in the living room because i can't figure out this like two times two mm -hmm. you know huh I think that kind of comes down to the purpose of the anger, where it's coming from. I usually like to describe this as flavor. So I feel like anger could sometimes be just overstimulation and mm. feeling overwhelmed. And that is not necessarily emotional. It could just be a very objective um, sensory and energetic experience. and anger can also be an emotional experience and that is usually the more heavy expressions of anger because it usually is contingent on you expressing that towards another person because mm -hmm. um, usually if you're emotionally angry it's triggered by a person or situation that mm -hmm. involves people um, and so when you feel the anger it comes out it comes right back out to the people that activated that within you um, and so in that sense, I feel like it's important to, I would love for people to start to tune into where their anger is coming from, because it could be really confusing when, especially if you're neurodivergent or sensitive to experience being overstimulated or overwhelmed and people assume that you're this emotionally, um, dysregulated person, um, you're irrational and all that stuff. And then it, inside you're like but i i don't feel necessarily emotional about this it's just that sound is really annoying me and i feel overwhelmed right now mm. um and you kind of need to like get that energy out and regulate yourself again which is usually like stimming or moving or something like that um and i feel like when it comes to you know safe anger or bad anger I kind of associate that to whether the anger is expressive or if it's something that someone is placing on another person, like an emotional weight, like placing that responsibility onto another person because they're angry. Because um, if it's just expressive anger, like you're just screaming at the TV or like mm -hmm. screaming in general because you're that's the way you want to express yourself, that could be like you said, funny or entertaining. And you know that, that it's not for you to take on yourself. It's yeah. just they're they're expressing themselves. It's, it has nothing to do with you, right? Mm -hmm. Versus like when I say projecting your anger on another person, it's like I'm angry at you and I'm going to be screaming at you. I'm going to be saying passive aggressive, aggressive comments towards you. And basically what's happening is like they're taking all of that and they're kind of putting the ball or the hot potato in your hand. And they're wanting you to like 
find a way to interact back. And that's a lot to put on another mm. person, you know? Yeah, actually, um, I was thinking about it even in terms of like being a content creator. Um, well, okay, no, no, no. Uh, related to relationship and then content creator. I think in a relationship, like a romantic relationship, um, I saw my parents who I think have like a really successful marriage. I would argue it's like really successful. Um, when they would get angry, they would yell at the problem, never at each other. They okay. would be emotional at the problem as a yeah. team, but never at each other. Like I didn't witness my parents like cursing at each other or hitting each other or engaging. They were never each other's enemy. And I think that that is something that I take into my relationship is like when I'm frustrated, I often pace and I yell away from my partner and in the direction of my frustration. So he doesn't have to take on that energy that I don't want to send it his way. But I also mm. want to save space to be angry or upset or frustrated or like sometimes I'll like stomp into the room and he can tell I'm about to rant for a long time. And I'm like, oh, I read this comment and like I'm very upset at this. Like, oh, and I know it's a miscommunication, but I'm upset that it even happened in the first place. And like it's not about him, but he's this like vessel that consents to like listening and witnessing. Yeah. Without making it about him. I think I would be terrified in some ways, if my partner turned his anger at me, because then I'd be like, oh, my God, wait, what's happening? Like, why are we angry at each other? Now, in my 20s, I had toxic relationships where we would turn the anger on each other. When we were frustrated, we'd be like, you are the problem. You. And it was like, oh. And so after therapy and especially through philosophy stuff, I've decided personally to stop blaming people for things. I think blaming or fault isn't doesn't seem to be helpful, much like punishment. I don't want to punish mm -hmm. you. I don't want to blame you. I just want to observe the behavior. And so I think as a streamer, often I'll, I'll be ranting and having fun and people are like, oh my God, are you angry? And I'm like, Shh, I'm getting my bag and we're having fun right now. But I also say that to allow the audience who's new to recognize that like we're just playing it up, but I'm not actually angry. I'm not going to think about this after stream. I'm not, I'm not taking on that burden of that anger. But also if the person I'm observing happens to see the video, I want them to know, like, I'm not angry at you. I'm not your mom. But, like, I don't know you. I'm just, like, making commentary about what I'm observing. And I think that that is really important to say out loud because I do think anger sells. I think there's a whole part of the internet that makes money being angry and encouraging people to be angry. And I do think it's probably not contributing to good overall. I think it's probably contributing more negative. And mm -hmm. so I don't want to be a – I don't want to be a contributing factor to that. And then at the same time – I don't want to pretend that anger is an invalid emotion when I value happiness, I value sadness, I value anger. I feel like anger is just an emotion and it's about the relationship you're having with it that really, really matters. I think you can have healthy anger. I think you can have unhealthy anger. I think you can have justified anger and then unjustified anger. You know? Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm writing my thoughts down. Please. What you were saying kind of reminds me of something that we talked about at the beginning of this. Um, when it comes to women feeling uncomfortable or people feeling uncomfortable with women's anger, um, when you were talking about when you're more emphatic on stream and then mm. people are saying, oh, are you angry? Um, kind of, I took that as they're checking in on you, seeing if you're okay mm -hmm. and seeing if they need to help comfort you or whatever. Um, I feel like that's kind of that discomfort with women's anger is a lot of the times I think associated with people's responsibility that they feel towards taking on other people's, you know, baggage, their mm -hmm. emotions mm -hmm. and resolving it for them especially when when I'm talking about women on women type of interactions, I've noticed that a lot of the discomforts I feel towards interacting with other women and having um, interpersonal relationships with them is, is directly associated with this broken relationship to anger and how I feel like I don't have space to express myself without the other person automatically wanting to take it on and resolve it for me. And mm. that's a lot. So 
I don't, I don't want to ever put that on people. So it's easier to just like deal with it on your own. And if you do want to express, let's say anger, I feel like women don't know how to just witness each other move through things mm. and genuinely standing by and letting it happen and play through. Um, you know what I'm saying? Whereas, and it's not necessarily a good or bad thing. There's good and bads to everything, right? But there's a sense of comfort in, let's say, friendships with men where they let you do your thing, mm. good or bad. Yes, a part of it is like they don't hold each other accountable or you guys don't hold each other accountable. But I think a part of it is like you give each other agency to exist and express without the other person almost like attaching themselves to you and becoming one person like yeah. that fusion. Um, I feel like I I tend to cope better with that dynamic than someone who's like, let's become one and deal with each other's stuff together. It's it's just a lot. Mm you know, but, um, hmm. I feel like something that kind of keeps coming to mind is this concept of what is healthy anger. I feel like healthy anger has, I, I first think of the purpose of the anger and how are you expressing it? I feel like healthy anger is takes a lot of self awareness mm. for someone to make it healthy, understanding why they're angry, um, and understanding you know what did they want to do about it? Because a lot of the times I pe I feel like people miss that part. Anger like I keep saying, is directed towards another person and they have to take responsibility. So I feel like healthy anger is like, I'm angry because of this and this is what I want to do about it moving forward or this is how I want to respond. Um, taking accountability for it, knowing how you want to direct it. And it's more so focused on yourself rather than the other person, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I feel like it takes a lot to get to a point where you could do something like that um, and know how to navigate it when you're like, I was activated by this person. It was shitty. I feel this way, but this is how I want to move forward with mm. it. You know? There. Okay. Okay. A couple of thoughts. I would, I'm going to expand upon what you said about like the different dynamics between the men and the women, but in mm -hmm. my brain, I'm going to like gender neutral it. So okay. I find that there are categories of gender that express themselves in a particular way when it comes to anger. So I've noticed that with me, there's the problem solving friends and the venting listening friends and the friends I go to to vent in so they can listen to me are friends that are like, I'm not going to problem solve you, but I'm here to listen to you. And then the friends that I go to for problem solving, it's because their brains do it whether they like it or not. And sometimes I'm that friend where I just like automatically start problem solving for people but then I have to remind myself not to do that because people are often just coming to vent to me which is different like it's not about me they're, they're not even asking me to take it upon myself they're asking me to witness it so mm -hmm. I'm like okay I will witness your anger without making it about me but that's really difficult because I notice that friends that are like conflict avoidant and I Definitely have moments where I'm conflict avoidant, believe it or not. I know I look like somebody who's great with conflict. I'm actually pretty conflict avoidant. Mm -hmm. um, I try really hard. Like I get overwhelmed and overstimulated. And I'm like, I if this doesn't feel like a safe enough space for us to express ourselves, like I bottle up a lot of the time. So when I have friends who do the same because I'm like putting down my boundaries or I'm saying absolutely not they'll be like oh you're getting really angry I can't deal with this but at the same time I'm in an environment so I, again I don't want to blame them for triggering my anger I want to say now I'm in an environment where you are stating something about me that is so untrue it's inappropriate so I'm gonna get louder and and like more like clear with my language this is incorrect stop doing this and what they will often do is like you're angry I don't I'm not going to talk to you while you're angry. And I'm like, but every time you talk to me, you devalue and, and, and devalue my, me and what I'm saying. So you're creating an environment. We are now in an environment. I'm not trying to blame you in which you will always make me angry because you are literally saying to me 
that nothing I say about myself is valid. And so it's like, what do you do in that situation except to be angry? And then you have to recognize that like, okay, the environment is making me upset. Can we negotiate to change the environment? Not you. I don't want to change you. I want to change the environment. That is so hard. That is so hard because the person on the other end has to recognize I'm not attacking them. I'm attacking how we've constructed this environment. And then the second thing that comes to mind is even this week, because I had to like end my stream and I was having this like possible migraine and I was trying to stop it. And I was on the couch and my husband walks into the room and he goes, oh, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm so angry. I'm just so angry. I just want to work. I just want to like continue doing my work. I was so excited and I was enjoying. I just did this great photo shoot and I want to edit this photo shoot. And I'm angry that I can't do anything. And he was like, okay, well, what do you, what do you want to do in the meantime? And I was like, I can't do anything. I just have to sit here in the dark. I was sitting in the living room with all the lights turned off and just like moping like a baby. But I also think that I was having an okay relationship with my anger because it was kind of like a soft anger. I wasn't like letting, I wasn't crying. It wasn't enveloping my body. I wasn't taking it out on him. I was just like moping kind of. I was just like, I'm so angry. But then if I look back on it, I kept saying the words, I'm so angry. But I think it was a little not accurate. I think I was mostly annoyed. But I wanted to be angry. And I think I couldn't even be angry because like, what are you going to do? It's like, like, what are you going to do? It's got a migraine. Like, or it's a possible migraine. Like, what are you going to do? You can't do anything about it. So you kind of got to let it go. And so I wonder like why I chose to use those words. Like, I'm so angry. When I'm like, that's not even accurate. But it feels like the most accurate to explain the way I was annoyed. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah. I wonder if it's because you wanted to do something about it. Mm. I feel like usually anger is felt when you want to do something about it or you're thinking of some sort of action. And I imagine if I were to put myself in your shoes, you had a migraine, it's, you know, taking you away from work or your day, you're feeling a sense of like, I need to, and I want to get my day going and continue with it, but I can't. And now I'm stuck here. And that makes me angry and frustrated. Yeah, like, yeah, I get a little frustrated. And like, I'm such a Um, I was having such a great day. I was wearing a cute dress. I was like excited for life. And even today, I have an anxiety that I'm going to get a migraine again or that my brain's going to explode again. So now I'm holding on to this like anxiety, but I'm not really angry about it. I think it's a little bit funny, but a little bit not funny. Like there's a Uh part of me that when things are going wrong, it's kind of funny. But I know that in the past – And I guess I wanted to talk about this a little bit. I used to be like a very angry person. Mm -hmm. Like I would like kick my car. I would like punch Mm -hmm. a wall. Mm -hmm. I would like express myself in violent ways, um, mostly at inanimate objects or something that was myself. Like I remember, so embarrassing, uh, I was really, really frustrated and I was overwhelmed And I didn't know my – I was dating somebody at the time. I didn't know his parents were there. I thought they had left the house. And in my fit of anger, because I was so frustrated, like I was in like a very complicated relationships in my 20s that I just like – they were so beyond my capabilities of handling. I get so frustrated that like I like threw my stuff on the floor like a a tantrum. Mm -hmm. And I was so angry and I was like, I'm so fucking mad. And I like threw my shit on the floor and his parents were home and they're like, whoa. And I was like, I am so embarrassed. I'm so sorry. I did not know you were here. I just wanted a safe space to express my anger without making it other people's problems. But I did not know you were here. And they're like, it's okay. And I was like, my bad. And I was like embarrassed. And so I I think there needs to be a safe space to sort of express that anger because I think what it is, it's like almost like a frustration with all of these feelings in your body and you just want to get it out. And you talked about that in your video about Taekwondo, I think you said. Um, Jiu-Jitsu. Oh, did you – okay. That's – oh, my brother does that. Okay, cool. So, like, that – like, having a place to, like, give your anger, like, express it in a way that isn't 
so offensive. You know what I mean? So I'm I'm very physical, right? I did a lot of BDSM, platonic, like wrestling stuff. I did a lot of like roughhousing with my brothers. I do a lot of roughhousing with my husband. Like I just, I need a physical outlet to like wrestle somebody or get out my, you know, my energy, I think. Yeah. But I, but I know in my twenties, I was significantly more, I relied on my anger. I relied on her like she was my lifeline. And now I don't have the same relationship with her. I haven't punched a wall in years. Uh, I haven't hit a car in years. My car, me, like me. Again, I would only self-inflict, right? I don't, I don't hit people. I don't express it to other people. If I can consensually wrestle with someone, that's the greatest. But like I don't express my anger to others in that way, um, like physically. I need to, you know, but I, I really resonated with what you said in your video about that, like needing a space to do that. But I think I worry that people are going to feel so fearful and overwhelmed by angry people that they're going to think that they're evil or, you know, you should never express your anger because that means you're like weak. And then it goes back to the same toxic cycle of like, don't cry, it's weakness, mm -hmm. you know? Hmm. Kind of going off of what you were saying when you were younger and you experienced a lot of anger. I feel like when that happens, it's because anger is, it enables movement forward and outward. So it's kind of like an indication that you're in a place, even if that's just the time you, the time of your life that you're in, not even just like an actual physical location, but like, you're just not safe with, you don't feel safe with where you're at in life. Mm. And I think for many people who are in that space, and I've been there too, the only way to keep yourself moving forward is to have this layer of anger surrounding you. And it's kind of like interlaced with everything that you do and how you approach things. Cause it's really effective to a big extent. It's like mm. a survival mechanism. Like, there's a reason why for a lot of people who are going through really hard circumstances, for me, it was like my early 20s too. You literally can't afford to be depressed or sad yeah. or process those type of emotions because those emotions are very like solitary and internal. Anger is very external and it moves you through everything you need to keep going in your mm -hmm. life. And so in that sense, when I see like, people who are just naturally more angry or more anxious and including myself in different parts of my life, it's kind of an indication that they don't have a safe space in that moment and they have to keep moving from one thing to the next, to the next, mm. to the next. Um, in that sense, like you, I feel like I could empathize in a way um, and not judge. And I feel like a good indication that you're kind of arriving in a safer place in your life, both externally and internally, is the amount of anger that you're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. Is that oh, like sure. increasing and things like that? Um, because you can almost afford to be still and to process and internalize and things like that. Oh, absolutely. Oh, gosh. The differences are beautifully just so, so different. Like, I don't even know how I walked around with so much anger inside of my body, but then you're right. It was a survival mechanism. And, you have to. and when people were angry with me, I was like, mm. I'm angry too, girl. Like I could be angry too. It was like, it almost felt like this great shield, like a magical power almost like, oh, you're angry. You want to watch me be angry? I'll be yeah. angry. You know what I mean? And so I, um, I wonder when I was listening to you talk about your family, one question mm -hmm. I wasn't sure about, maybe I missed it is like, where are you guys now with that mm -hmm. anger that you dealt with with like your father and stuff like that? Like I'm a little confused on the story. Like where's your family now if you don't mind talking about it? Yeah, so I feel like in general my family isn't super close. Mm -hmm. I feel like in that sense we went through so much trauma together that there needs to be a lot of time where that relationship mends itself um, slowly. And that's contingent on us all mending ourselves on our own too, which is why it takes so long. But with my dad, I think 
ever since him and my mom divorced, which is something I had to ask them to do mm -hmm. um, when I was in high school, because they they would fight every day and my mom would come sleep in my room, which yeah. is really inappropriate, um, even though we had other rooms for her to sleep in. But she it was just me, her and my dad at that point, And my brothers were off in college and she knew that she could kind of like get me on her side and there's like a survival mechanism in that. Yeah. Um, and ever since they, they split ways and I was like, this isn't working. We, we all need to like move away from each other. I basically didn't really talk to my dad ever since then. Um, because I was no longer forced into the same four walls with him. Mm. Um, same thing goes for my brothers when they left for college, they didn't talk to him either. So we all kind of naturally just went no contact because we didn't want a relationship with him. And he always made it feel like we had to have it with him because he was the one taking care of us. So if we weren't with him, then we would be out on the streets and things like that. Um, and so I basically didn't talk to my dad for many years and my brothers didn't either. And I got to a point where I felt comfortable having a relationship with him again. And so we would, um, I would go visit him at his house and things like that. But there were essences of his abuse that would still come up every now and then. And I think during COVID was the last time that he tried to like do some sort of like financial abuse type of stuff. And I drew a really intense hard boundary and was like, that's not, not okay. This is why I don't feel comfortable with you. I'm not talking to you. And then I like blocked him on everything. And I didn't talk to him for, I think, a year or two. Mm. I went no contact again. Um, and I think it took me a long time. It was nice for me to just get space. And I needed space multiple times because you don't just get over the things that he would do to us. Yeah. Um, and I feel like my brothers also have had space since college. Like one of my brothers moved to New York where all of us are on um, in California. Mm. So one of my brothers just went to New York. He's the middle child. He's just very peaceful and neutral, mm. but he's also like, I'm going to be across the country and do yeah. my own thing. Um, me and my oldest brother are here and we're more involved. And that's so funny. I was, what a stereotype. The middle child like is, you know what I mean? On their own. Yeah, yeah that's kind of funny. And so I'm usually kind of the spearhead of these types of like mental health conversations. I've been on and off no contact mm -hmm. with my dad. And luckily my brothers are both very stoic. They're both Tauruses. Um, <laughs> so they're really good at just being like, okay, you do you. We're not gonna judge, but we're not necessarily gonna do the same things type yeah. of a thing. Um, and I kind of told my dad, in order for me to talk to you, you have to sincerely apologize to me. Mm. Um, set that clear boundary of like, this is what I need from you to continue being having a relationship with you. Um, it took him two years to finally say, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then right now I've been in contact with him, but very sparsely. Mm. Um, and it's complex because my oldest brother went no contact with him too around the same time and mm -hmm. hasn't talked to my dad for two years too. And only recently did they, they literally met up like a few weeks ago for oh, the first wow. time. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty bad. Like my, my brother's wife is pregnant and my dad didn't know anything about it because yeah. my brother didn't tell him and stuff like that. So when my dad went to meet up with him, he was like, surprised because she's basically about to give birth and yeah. he found out about his third grandchild like that mm -hmm. um and i think the first time i i met up with my dad again after no contact recently um we spent literally i think six hours talking about everything that we've all went through and it was pretty intense and even during that conversation, I was like very stoic. Mm -hmm. And a part of that is numbing yourself a little bit, mm -hmm. you know? So 
it's it's one of those things where in the moment you're very well spoken and you're intellectualizing but after the fact you like cry when you realize what that was to you yeah and he kind of just basically said he admitted like he basically regrets how he raised us and he mm. it was a very human moment he was like i wasn't ready for kids and i he basically was like i fucked up because of that mm. um, if i were to be a dad now i wouldn't have made the same decisions and that was really big and it was a humanizing point and i think i was in a good place to understand that because at this point i don't see him as a dad necessarily i see him as a person yeah and so i can un i could listen to him and understand like okay yeah like if i had a kid at that age i wouldn't be ready you know things like that um but all in all my my relationship with my family is all very cordial i feel like it's so weird we could talk about these types of things but at the same time we can't say i love you to each other or mm -hmm. hug each other we don't see each other often we can only see each other every now and then like maybe once every few months we see and talk to each other yeah it's very sparse but i don't know yeah that's and i noticed that with my brothers because of how my dad raised us they have even worse repressed anger than i do Mm. to a point where they repress everything else even the good parts of expression and feeling if yeah. that makes sense yeah yeah so so where are you in terms of if you could i guess i don't want to make you put a number to it or something but on a scale of one to ten like where is your anger now compared to where it used to be is it now like if especially if you're talking about repressed anger it, we might not even know you know what i mean the level but like do you feel like you are getting having a better relationship with it I feel like I wouldn't be able to say a definitive answer until I've observed myself enough times, mm -hmm. which I generally don't feel angry often. Um, the situations that I feel angry in is when it's completely irrational and unfair and there's no resolution. And therefore there's all this energy that has nowhere to go. And that's usually where that, that anger comes from. And I don't find myself in those situations often anymore because I work from home. Mm -hmm. I have control over who I see and who I talk to, right? And so in a sense, it's easy to foster peace in that way. Mm -hmm. But I feel like where I'm at with anger is that I tend to notice that when I get angry, I choose to just walk away from it if I can afford to. So for example, like you said, there's comments sometimes from people where it gets you really frustrated and angry. Mm -hmm. Those are moments where I choose to walk away um, and not interact. But if it's interpersonal relationships face to face, then I, I usually tell the person like, I need space. I need to go do my thing and regulate myself. And I think that regulation practice is something that is changing um, as my relationship to anger is healing is like, instead of just going straight to breath work and getting myself calm, if I need to, I'll move it out somehow, whether that's on a walk or something, mm -hmm. um, move it out. And then after it's out, then I kind of go through the calming down processing type of thing. Ooh. Yeah. I'm curious about, well, I guess two questions that coincide. Your parents, do they acknowledge I guess in like a real way that you're ADHD ironically I feel like my parents recognize that more than my brothers hmm. and I think it's because my brothers are so repressed with emotions like the right mm -hmm. side of their brain and like everything has to be intellectualized and make sense logically because huh. my parents actually support me and what I do a lot. Like they literally, my dad keeps up to date with my videos and I was surprised by that. Cute. And my mom does too. And 
I feel like I, I always get a sense where my brothers know that I'm officially diagnosed, but the only thing that makes them believe it is that there's a neuropsychologist that evaluated me. That's so, so it's not funny. that they believe me, but they yeah. believe the neuropsychologist. Wow. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. How does being ADHD play into anger? Do they relate? Do you have moments? Do you associate them with anger? I think your neurotype relates to everything in your life because your brain is the filter for everything that you're experiencing. So in a sense, yeah, ADHD <laughs> affects every aspect of my mm -hmm. life and me. Um, it affects me in a sense where I'm so sensitive to all these different things. Like I'm sensitive to sensory things, which is objective. I'm sensitive to energies, which is like emotional and intuitive. And I'm sensitive to, you know, hmm, what else is there? Yeah, I feel like it's mainly those things like, like sensing and also emotions. Um, and also it doesn't make it easier when your thought process is just different and it's hard for you to kind of understand how to process and communicate what's going on in internally because there's just so much going on. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, autistic brains literally have more neuropathways. I mean, not neuropathways. Autistic brains have more, what is it called? synapses than holistic brains so we literally have more information we're processing and it could be so much to like consolidate all of it and understand what that means to you and how you're going to communicate that to others because a lot of the times even if you figure that out internally the way you externalize it isn't necessarily acceptable so there's that whole process and i feel like because of that dynamic, it's easier to repress your anger in a way because you're already doing all of that mental work and internalizing and filtering and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and ironically, I feel like because I'm so sensitive, I probably need to get that out of me more often, but I'm not or I wasn't for many years. Mm -hmm. So I feel like you know, I forgot what the question was. I want to know how they relate. So like I was thinking about the idea of if you're neurodivergent and yeah. you're stimulated or overstimulated in a particular way, I wonder if it leads to a different relationship with anger. So I will say like I was eating this morning with my husband while we were watching One Piece and I'm like, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm like, you know, touching him and he's just like touching me back because he was like, he mimics my like behavior. <laughs> and I'm just like, bro, I have so much in my body right now. And I'm yeah. just eating and drinking. I think it's the, I swear to God, it's the coffee. I think the caffeine hits me and then my body starts humming. And I think with the fibro recently, everything feels like if I eat too much sugar, or eat too much spice or eat too much anything, my whole body, then I'm just all of a sudden I've got to like stim or like touch him or like, you know, tap or like I can't like eat sitting still. And I, I it's just, I can feel it. And I wonder if I, I kept imagining like, what if this transformed to like, anger or frustration or maybe if I didn't know what it was like how frustrating that would be but like because I know what it is it's not a big deal but then I started to think okay what if I was like visiting someone or at a restaurant or like in a place where I would have to mask more or just be like you know appropriate what would that look like and I'm like I think that would be like extremely emotionally taxing which would yeah. probably mean that I would have to end the night earlier than if I was allowed to like get it out because now I have to go, you know, I was just thinking about all these layers and I just wondered if like the neurodivergency and the anger play a role like in meltdowns, frustrations, anything like that. Yeah, I think in a sense, we're not even talking about anger anymore. Mm. We're talking about overstimulation. Mm. Um, and that, of course, can lead to anger because you then if especially if you're used to intellectualizing things you're now viewing yourself as irrational or mm. you're viewing yourself as like, why am I experiencing this? I don't want to. And then that causes anger and frustration. Um, I feel like that kind of 
that whole dynamic is usually what leads to meltdowns is like you're going through something and there's nothing you could do about it. And you understand all that there's nothing you could do about it. And then you feel even more overwhelmed um, because then that overstimulation gets even more intense. And now it's laced with an um, like that feeling of anger and helplessness. Um, that's why a lot of the times external meltdowns look violent and are violent, mm. which is why people learn to suppress them because it, it is quite literally just you're there's too much going on inside of you and you need to get it out. And there's nothing else that you could even concentrate on than to get it out. Um, that's why a lot of people, including the autistic person themselves, are so scared of their externalized meltdowns because after the fact, you feel so ashamed of it and you're scared that that even came out of you. You know, there's been times where during a meltdown, I'll be like, one time I had a meltdown in the car and I was like kicking my dashboard so hard. Like I could have basically dented the mm -hmm. dashboard. Um, and I, even in those moments, I'm like, that doesn't sound like me. I wouldn't do something like that, but it's just so intense. You're so overstimulated and overwhelmed. Um, and you're screaming on top of it is another part of meltdowns. And it's not, I feel like people misunderstand the physical aspect of needing to get energy out of themselves. They, I feel like it's, people are scared of it and they usually think it's associated to anger, mm. maybe even emotions, but sometimes it's not even really about that. It's just like, you're so flooded by sensory input and you have nothing to do with it. And you just want to get it out of your body at that mm -hmm. point, you know? Yeah, I think these are all different categories. And that's why I think it's so important to know which one you're experiencing because they can be mistaken for one or the other. Yeah. You know, I remember in the video about anger, you said that you had like, I think you were in your car or somewhere and you screamed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have done that so many times, let me tell you. But especially when you're playing like a really good like – music album or you have like a really good song on in the background and like it lets you like gutturally get out all of those emotions you have pent up and then you just scream and it's like again I don't want anyone involved this isn't about anybody this is about me getting my feelings out and I think people make it about them and I think what I've learned to do is like when people are having anger relation like relationships with anger is not to make it about me but I think when I watch like um certain types of toxic masculinity in men like Andrew Tate comes to mind but he's probably not the best example but there's some sort of like fear that hits my brain where I'm like you're tall you have muscles you're angry and if you just decide to look at me like well now my life is in danger versus if I'm watching someone just express anger like that doesn't bother me as long as it's not targeted towards me like I, I don't know if you ever heard this growing up but growing up like if the boys it's usually a boy thing is showing a lot of like frustration or anger the parents will be like go hit something outside go hit something that happened a lot in my bubble or I saw it on tv shows or I saw it in like media where they'd be like go outside and hit something but I'm not sure that I ever heard that re reinforced in women I think if I'm, I'm trying to think of what was our what was I told to do and I think it was like go outside but I don't remember being told to go hit something I think I was told to go like just be outside, like climb a tree or like dance or something. But I remember explicitly the boys being told to go hit something. And mm -hmm. I wonder if that relates to like boys will be boys. And so they associate like some sort of like a, a different sort of – again, I don't – I personally think like gender is only helpful if you're talking about a specific context. But in general, I think all humans will fall into certain categories of how they express and need solutions, especially related to anger. But again, I think anger is like the result of frustration unresolved, mm -hmm. you know? And also, okay, here's where I wanted to really talk to you about. I want to talk to you about the philosophy of anger. Mm -hmm. What role does anger play in our lives that's actually a tool that's needed? Like is anger mm -hmm. a needed tool? What do you think mm -hmm. about that? I definitely think anger is a needed tool. Um, I think it's, I feel like it's completely necessary. And if people are denying themselves of having a relationship with anger, they're not 
ever going to keep growing as a person. Um, I think anger a lot of the times is directly associated to your life force energy, basically like your, what makes you human and what makes you want to be here and mm. live life and make your choices. There's a reason why people who aren't angry are a lot of the times so subdued and like monotone, you know mm. what I'm saying? And a lot of the times the most expressive people have a pretty close relationship to their anger, whether it's healthy or not. You know what I'm saying? Like people who are very expressive and show like love and joy and happiness and funniness mm -hmm. or whatever. They're also people who will get angry and express it too when they feel it. Whereas people who are very stable and stoic, they don't experience anger, but they also aren't really super expressive warm people, you know? Um, but kind of like a side note back to boys will be boys. Mm. I can't relate to that because I don't know if it's just my family bubble or if it's an East Asian thing, but men were also not encouraged to express anger. We're not encouraged really? to express anything really. Oh. Um, in our culture, it's like, what is respectable is to be quiet and to be very put together. I mean, if you watch um, Korean type of reality shows like Physical 100 and you see how stoic everyone is, mm -hmm. even observing the way they, they smile, if you look closely, like Asians, a lot of the times, the way that we smile isn't like a full on smile. Like it's mm -hmm. always hiding in some sort of way. So... For example, I see a lot of this. Oh, interesting. Or like this. Mm. When people are trying to smile, it, it's like just this feeling as if like expressing yourself internally and any emotion is seen as like unnecessary and almost like disrespectful to the environment mm. and the people in it. Like you have to be put together. You have to make yourself presentable is another thing. Like our physical appearance and our behaviors are like the thing that we manage the most. And a part of that is also like your career and the things that you're producing um, objectively. Like there's this ideal of like no emotions or subjectivity is respected, if that makes sense. Totally. And so for my brothers and I, gender wasn't really a thing in our household in a sense. Like if any of us were feeling angry, we would, the way that my parents would deal with it is to just like lock us in the garage by ourselves until we were done. <laughs> and then when we calmed down, they would let us out. <laughs> That's crazy. That's so different. That's so interesting. It's like oh. make yourself presentable and then come back or... Mm. For me, I would I would have a lot of like meltdowns as a child and my parents would mm. basically shame me for it and be like, oh, Irene's Irene's having a princess moment. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. They would say that in Chinese, kind of insinuating like she's being irrational and reasonable and mm -hmm. like just hysterical, I guess. That's so kinda funny. Undesirable, basically. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's funny. We got bullied or shamed for crying. Like, you're being so dramatic. Or, like, if you mention the T word in the house, like trauma, everybody rolls their eyes. Cause I'm like, it's real people. And they're like, even on the internet, people are so annoyed with me, keep saying trauma. But I'm like, I'm just saying an objective the, word, like a thing. It's a thing. Yeah. It's not, it's, I'm not insulting you, bros. But everyone's just like, ugh, trauma. And I'm like, you're so, okay. But like, actually, anger. We were allowed to express emotions. Like, we were never punished for being angry. Like, I noticed we all slammed doors in our household, whether we're in a good mood or a bad mood. Like, we actually just all slammed. We're the loudest people who have ever existed. Even my partner, I need to get him noise-canceling headphones because I'm just, like, the <laughs> loudest human who's ever existed. But, like, when we're angry in my household growing up, my dad would stomp out of the house and slam the door. Or, like, he would – like, I would do that. I'd be like, ooh, I'm leaving and I would like stomp out and I would slam the door to show them how angry I was and they would just like sit there and roll their eyes and so we weren't it was weird it was like we weren't punished for being angry so we were allowed to be angry but we also were like we roll our eyes at each other like we're just like 
They're like, you're so dramatic. But at the same time, it's our way of saying, like, I'm not afraid of you. And I don't feel like I should be afraid of you. But I'm also, like, uh, ignoring you or I'm not validating you in a way as well. But yet it was weirdly validating because they didn't punish us for being angry. Like, it was the weirdest dichotomy. It was, like, the weirdest mismatch of, like, like my parents don't believe in, like, ADHD or autism for their kids or they believe in medication or anything. So when one of us gets diagnosed with something, we're like, hey, just so you know, they're like, <sighs> you know, it's like that. It's like every, they just think everything's for attention, but it is for attention, but it's not the kind of attention they think it's for. It's like, yeah, we need medical attention or we need like emotional attention or we need an acknowledgement of something. So the irony is like we are allowed to be like my mom always says all her kids are exactly the way they should be and they don't need a diagnosis to explain what's normal. And I'm like, oh, interesting. So it's like instead of thinking like autism is something, it's nothing. It's just how you are. But yet because you need special attention or specific needs met that like you can't just give to every kid. It's like it's like do you know what I'm saying? It's like it's almost like it's almost good but bad. It's almost like again, it's like oh, the intentionality is good. Like, I love my kids no matter how different they are. But also, I'm not going to put a label on it. But then without mm -hmm. the label, there comes a lot of disadvantages to how school is working or why meltdowns are happening or why there's overstimulation. And then they say, well, why are you acting like that? It's like, well, look at this label thing that I was given, like the borderline. It's like, borderline. They're like, no, that's not it. And I'm like, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so it's kind of interesting, like, being in a world where, again, you could be yourself, but also not yourself. Yeah. What I think of is like, you're only allowed to exist how they already exist themselves. And if you exist outside of that, then that gets judged. Because mm -hmm. that's what I think about when I see judgmental family members, when they may really love and support you theoretically, but if you start to do things that they don't necessarily do for themselves or align with, it, it's triggering for them, mm. you know, um, because they don't understand it. And in many ways, that very thing is most likely something they would probably benefit from if they were to integrate it for themselves. But they had to actively choose to not integrate it. And so it's a lot to see someone else do something for themselves that you have had to ignore and mm. do ignore when it comes to your own choices. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, I guess, how people respond to their own internal realizations. Like there's people who will have those realizations and be like, wow, I feel activated right now. It's because I feel like maybe I'm failing myself if I mm. see Brittany doing things for herself. So if that's the case, do I want to try to like do more things for myself so I don't feel as triggered? Or people will usually turn to like, oh, why is she doing that? I don't get it. Why is that necessary? That's stupid. Because that's what they tell themselves in order totally. to ignore those needs, you know? Totally, totally. It's interesting going back to um, like the expressing, you know, have you heard of that thing where people trust you more if you cuss? No, if he, it, it translates, it signals to the brain like a more trusting, like I trust you more because you're willing to cuss. It's it sends like a so I wonder if anger plays a role in that versus like um, maybe crying or other things. Maybe it feels like, oh, they're more honest because they're showing me something they shouldn't be showing me versus the reality, which I think like anger, though often good, is also a cover up, which is where I think toxic masculinity plays a role. Yeah. Like you rely on that anger to shield from what's really happening, but people translate it into their brain as like them being more honest. And I wonder if there's a little bit of that happening because even cussing can be performative. You ever hear somebody mm -hmm. cuss and you're like, that feels performative. Like that's not even a part of your personality. Yeah. And I wonder about that too, if people use things that traditionally signal something, but if it's not coming from an authentic place, then you're getting the authentic expression of it, which is why I think intuitively anger can be very scary or even crying. I learned yesterday on stream, they said, in their bubble, crying can be seen as manipulative. And I was like, oh, I, in my bubble, it's seen as weak. Only weak people cry. Manipulation would be more like a char charisma or something. So I wonder if anger feels intuitively like false sometimes because it is also a cover up 
in in some ways when people are expressing themselves. Um, and one more thought I had before I give it to you is you said in your video that one of the things you'd want to change is if you had children, mm -hmm. you would like let them express themselves in a particular way. And I wonder um, if that is like a new thought or if that's a thought that's in motion. Like, is that a is a permanent decision? Because I always wonder this, like how much should we let kids express themselves? And at what point should we teach them to like get their shit under control because like what's the difference between being disciplined and getting your shit under control and also having a space to express yourself the way i see it now at this point and of course i i am open to this changing throughout my life is anger is more about an overabundance of energy in your body that you have to get out and do something about it and the emotions that could be lying underneath is something that you access and process after you've expressed that excess energy. So I feel like when it comes to my kids, something that feels right to me is to give them ways to express their anger physically. That doesn't necessarily have to be aggressive or violent. Hmm. Like even just dancing really hard, I think could be an expression of anger and getting it out of your body. Um, or like making silly, weird faces, I think is a really great way to get stuff out of your body. Mm -hmm. These are all things, if you think about it, if you do as an adult, people will think you're mentally ill. Mm -hmm. You know, if mm -hmm. you saw someone flailing their body in the middle of the park, just dancing really hard or like making all these crazy faces, sticking their tongue out and whatnot, people will literally immediately think you're mentally ill. Yeah then that's like a whole other topic. Like, why is it that physical regulation is associated to being mentally ill when in reality, you will probably be less mentally ill if you regularly <laughs> express yourself physically. Um, and so I feel like if I ever saw my kids be angry, I would want to teach them ways to get it out of their body first. And then after the fact, when they feel like they're regulated, and there's not that buzzing in their body or their hearts not racing and there's all this tension. Once that's all dealt with, that's when the processing part comes in. So like what information came up during that expression mm -hmm. and how do we process what this means to you and how do we choose what we want to do moving forward? Mm -hmm. Basically, like these are your choices and which one sounds good to you right now. Um, I say that because I saw some comments of people like, yeah, but I still don't think teaching people how to be violent is okay. And I'm just like, they totally missed the point. I yeah. feel like, um, like I'm not saying like go punch someone and then you're, you're a better person and you finally got it out of you. It's not about that. Right. Um, I feel like, I feel like not expressing that excess energy is only damaging to a person it has to get out somehow. And there's ways to get it out that doesn't have to be correlated to aggression or violence. Yeah, it's funny it, that they associated the violence part. Like, where did that come from? It's really that simple, but I think our society has been trained for decades to be a certain way. So when you're used to thinking in that way, it's like so hard to imagine. But when you like kind of detach yourself from the general ideals of society it's really it's actually really easy to understand that you could express your anger physically without it being violent or aggressive absolutely you know? <clears throat> well i think that's where discipline also comes in i remember i had this um i nannied this this family of five they were so cute and one of the, the oldest son um was autistic and it was so funny when i first started nannying for this family we we're in a really small conservative town and they were like do you know what autism is? I was like, for sure, bro. And they're like, okay. And they even like would ask me like, do you know what this is? And do you know what this is? I was like, yep, I know what that is. And they're like, oh, okay. And I was like, I get it. And so they were like really excited to have a nanny who actually like understood. And the kid was really great. Like I really like just have such warm feelings about the family even to this day. And the kids were great and everything. But he would have like his 
just like anger moments and he would express it and he would come up to me and he'd be like, Miss B. And I was like, what's up? And he's like, something, 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 something. And he'd like, he does this and he would like lecture and I would look at him and he's like, and I'm very angry. And I was like, I can see that. And he we would talk about it. I was like, well, I think your anger like makes a lot of sense given the circumstance you just explained to me. He's like, but I want to stop being angry. And I was like, okay, well, we have like some methods in which we can like pursue in hopes that you will be less angry, but it's no guarantee because sometimes we just got to feel angry until we don't anymore. So mm -hmm. let's like give ourselves some options and we would do the options and he'd be fine after and it wouldn't take too long. But it was interesting the way he could so clearly express to me that he was angry. He could so, mm -hmm. he explained to me exactly why. I mean, it was so rational and reasonable that he was angry. I was like, yeah, I think that makes sense that you're angry. That's a perfectly decent reason to be angry. Now that there's, you know, there's always people who will say like, that's not a good enough reason to be angry. I would argue that it's, it's like totally often within reason to feel an emotion, you know, whether or not you think it's appropriate is really just like a projection you're making. And I always thought it was kind of impressive that this kid who was young, I mean, gosh, he seven, eight years old while I was with him, was able to sit there and process all his feelings and then explain to me why he was angry. The why is so key to all of this. Like, why are you angry? Because my concern ultimately is that association of anger and violence, I think does, and I'm going to gender it, come with that statistic of men expressing anger and violence in conjunction and mm -hmm. often taking it out on others. But that's not I don't want to say men are a monolith. I don't want to say this is like something we should assume will happen. Plenty of young boys are being given tools that their, you know, elders weren't given in terms of not needing to associate their anger with violence. Now, often a lot of the solutions we would use for this kid were related to dancing or letting things out or even like hitting a baseball or even like singing. He would love to sing and he would like sing like, like, say it's like Mary had a little lamb. You're like, Mary had a little lamb. And I was like, you know, it was just yeah. like letting it out. It was about not being afraid of the anger, but working with it. Just like you would with sadness. It really is. Just, or even happiness. Like, you ever meet someone who's a little too happy? It even annoys me. It does. I'm like, you're a little too happy for me right now. And like, there is a feeling of even that where I'm like, this is a lot. You're being a lot right now. There's a video of a woman that I'm assuming is fake, but she's like getting pancakes and she's like doing this and dancing. I think I've seen. No, I don't think it's fake. She's I've so happy like in a that. way that makes me upset. And it was so funny because everyone in the comments is like, I hate her. And I was like, why do I hate her? And it's not her. And we can't, I can't tell if it's because I think it's fake or if it's like too much happiness. But then when another person expresses a lot of happiness, I'm like celebrating it. And I think it's fun. And I think like I get excited. Like it's just like the way you ex can even express happiness can paint, can like bother people. And so I don't think it's even special to anger. Does that make sense? Like I'm trying to say it's not bad. I'm not moralizing it. Yeah. But even the way you express anger to some people, not a big deal. To other people, they're like end of the world. Happiness, I think is exactly the same way. Even sadness. For some people, the way you express sadness is like incredibly triggering. And for other people, it's just like, ah, you're sad. Mm -hmm. It's just a feat. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I feel like you're you, the way that you process other people's expression of their emotions is – definitely an indication of where you're at with that specific emotion internally. Mm. I I feel I resonate with you in a sense where when I see someone that's really happy and bubbly, it makes me uncomfortable because there is an aspect of like, is this genuine or is mm. this performative? And I don't know how to interact with that because I don't know how to get myself to that level. Mm. And you know, there's fears behind that, you know, as an autistic person, like I, am I going to be taken the wrong way since I can't match your energy? Because usually if someone's really bubbly and happy and they see that I have a flatter affect, they a lot of the times interpret that in so many different ways. Like I don't like them or I'm not wanting to talk to them and all of these things. So there's, you know, a lot of assumptions that we make up in our heads when we observe other people's expressions. Um, and a lot of that has to do with not even just the emotions themselves, but our ability to take accountability for ourselves and our emotions and set boundaries in appropriate ways. I feel like society as a whole, we are still trying to figure out how to do those things. Like, I don't think people realize that boundary setting is not for the other person. It's, 
it's for yourself right. and your emotions and how you respond to everyone is also about yourself. It's not about other people. So people think like setting boundaries nowadays means like you can't do this around me or like you can't say that that's triggering for me. Mm -hmm. It's more so about you observing like I feel really, you know, triggered when you talk about this certain subject. So what would help me is if you try to avoid it, you could choose to still talk about it. That's fine. But that just means I need to distance myself because that means yeah. I can't interact with you in a way that makes me feel safe. It's more so about like what you want to do. And in that process, you know, you give people options and directions with what could help. They could choose to help or they could choose to not care. Mm. But either way, you respond to whether or not they want to help you or not care. It's like, okay, if you don't care, that's fine too. I just need to go regulate on my own then, you know? But people don't know how to do that exchange because we're we're taught to be responsible for each other. Right. In a way that's like really unhealthy and makes us ignore ourselves mm -hmm. actively and take on other people's stuff. Like we we're literally taught to process other people's stuff and ignore our own, like consistently yeah. in every dynamic yeah. possible. Yeah. I, and I and I really think that's a universal experience humans have. And it's funny because a part of me thinks it comes from wanting to move as a society. So there's some benefit to that in, to some extent. And also it's about having that balance between being an individual and a community member. Often when I think people have conversations around boundaries or ultimatums or they're having conversations about regulating other people's emotions – Often it feels like a rejection, like, hey, when you're like this, I can't be around it. So I'm going to remove myself to the person listening to that could feel like, oh, so I have to change who I am for you to be around me. And it's like, no, I don't want to change who you are. I need to do this for me. But also if we want to hang out, there's like a level of compromise that happens. Like, look, even the best relationships will have conflict. The question is, what do you do when that conflict arises? And the conflict is a spectrum. It can be tiny or small. It can be like a whole lot of things. And so I think like when we're having these conversations, it is hard not to internalize, like you said, because we're taught to internalize. But also it's always a balancing game between what do I, what can I do in this moment and for whom? And that's why I say like, look, me first, then you, except now that I'm married, I will say it's like us first, then me. But not at the expense of me. And same with him. Us first, then him, but not at the expense of him. Mm -hmm. And I think it's incredibly difficult to know what I'm saying when I say that. Because I know a lot of people will like deny. That's why I think people have those divorce moments or those like midlife crises moments is they've suppressed themselves for the thus, for the us. But then in the process forgot they were always a them. Mm -hmm. And same with friendships or society in general. I'm going to sacrifice myself for my job. I'm going to sacrifice myself for my studies. I'm going to yeah. sacrifice. And yet it's like, what are you doing this for? Why are you mm -hmm. even doing this? And the, mm -hmm. if not for you. But then people are always worried like we live in an individual society and then we won't care about people. But if you're caring about people at the expense of yourself, it's like, guys, we have to have a balance. And mm -hmm. that's why I think I don't want to live in a society without anger. I want to live in a society that understands and has a relationship with their anger. Mm -hmm. You know, I just think it plays such an important role in growth. Yeah. And keep in mind, I, I keep saying anger and I am not saying violence. Mm -hmm. Because those are two different things to me. I feel like that kind of ties back to – a point that you brought up in the middle-ish of mm. this conversation, there's an aspect of anger that feels very genuine, which I think for certain types of people, for me, for example, being an autistic person, there's an aspect of anger I could appreciate depending on how the person's expressing it, right? Because I know that what they're communicating to me is coming from a genuine place and I could believe that and I could work with that is a thing um like I think that's why it's so different being an autistic person and my relationship with anger because I feel like I've learned to detach myself very very early on to other people's emotions in a sense where I 
can listen to them express why they're feeling something or why they're angry with me, for example. And I could know how to take that without letting it um, completely question everything about myself um, and objectify it. Like if someone's literally telling me, Irene, you annoy the crap out of me. You did this, you did that. I could objectively hear it out and be like, yeah, that does sound annoying. Mm -hmm. And I could understand why that would make you feel angry. If I were you, I'd probably be annoyed too mm. without, you know, for the week after just like thinking 24 seven, like, oh, I feel like shit. I'm a horrible person. They don't like me, blah, blah, blah. And I think a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, your relationship to yourself and your relationship to how you process things cognitively. I think a lot of the times neurodivergent people could are, are forced to process things in their own way on their own. And it makes it easier to make space for other people's emotions. Whereas if you're part of a collective, I think it's easy to enable the the act of ignoring yourself and your emotions and kind of like inheriting other people's opinions and thought processes and stuff like that. Um, I feel like a lot of the times the people who allow you space to feel your stuff are people who aren't afraid to be alone mm -hmm. and have, and have developed peace with their themselves. Oh. And so they allow you to exist on your own in a sense. It's not a threat to them, you know, um, and something that I've noticed is that I don't feel comfortable with men expressing their anger just because mm -hmm. it's a lot of the times, like you said, associated to violence, um, and oppression. But I do notice that when women express anger, that actually makes me feel more comfortable than if they were being really nice and cordial with me. Mm -hmm. I think the niceness and cordialness actually triggers me in women Whereas anger triggers me in men, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Is it because like women perform fakeness to fake nice and men perform anger to deny themselves like introspection into their own emotions? Yeah, basically, essentially, harm comes in different forms depending on talking in binary genders. Sure. I feel like harm comes from women stereotypically in a way where it's passive aggressiveness, mm. whereas harm coming from men is usually just blatant aggressiveness. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm scared to be harmed by aggression, but I'm also scared to be harmed by passive aggressiveness where yeah. I don't know what's happening. I don't know how to interpret it. I don't know how to respond. Mm. And it's mm. just like, what's going on here? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Either way, I, I don't want to deal with it. You know, I agree with this. Actually, okay, you know, when I said I was conflict avoidant earlier, this is what I mean. If I feel intuitively there's like a conflict happening that I either cannot process or understand or or like categorize, I'm going to avoid. I'm like, no, I don't know what's happening here. I don't know what you're doing. I feel like I'm being tricked. But something is not right here in my like little, you know, and ND sense, like my little spidey yeah. sense is tingling. And I'm like, mm, something's wrong here. No. And then same with violence where I'm like, oh, I feel like I can't communicate with this. Whatever this yeah. oh, it's that it's that if I feel like we're having like I cannot communicate with this. Yeah, I'm not going to engage. I know in my mm -hmm. like I I constantly have requests like, oh, will you talk to me? I want to talk to you on stream. I want to like debate you. And I'm like, I, no, because I know when I get inside of your like little bubble, you're going to give me nothing I can communicate with. And they're, yeah. they're either going to do either of those two things. They're either going to yell at me and I'm going to feel like, what am I doing here? Or mm. they're going to do the fake nice thing where I don't know how to communicate with them because I'm like, well, do you really think that's it though? Or do you think it's this? And I'm like, what are you doing? You're like, you're not asking me. We're not having a conversation of openness. Actually, I think that's what significantly was unique about you because we've talked a couple times in private Mm -hmm. Is And I even told my husband, I was like, I just talked to a human where I felt like I could just talk. <laughs> and like, I didn't have to think too much about what I was. I felt like everything I was going to say was going to be taken in good faith. I felt like you would genuinely not judge my like neuroses or the way that I spoke or like you would like translate it in the most good faith. And it just felt really safe, like so safe. And so mm. I feel like if I don't get that with people, I do want to have a wall up or two, if I, if it's on the other extreme side of that, if you make me feel completely safe on the other side of that, I won't even engage 
because like they're not even giving me a space to communicate in a way that will never like if they're gonna only hear me in bad faith like I refuse to engage and that is a boundary that I had to learn as a content creator especially where I'm like I know you keep saying you want to talk to me but you don't you want to talk at me yeah and I know that so I'm just gonna put a boundary down saying I don't Brittany does not engage with this category of person Mm -hmm. Because, like, it's not going to be good for me or the audience. It might yeah. be good for the audience in a way because they might see me react to it, but they're not going to get sustenance. They're not going to get value in a way that I feel like is worth doing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that authenticity plays a role. I can handle authentic anger. I think it's actually really kind of, like, vulnerable and wonderful. Like, Dr. K talks about this, how we encourage men to show their emotions but not anger. And if it's authentic to them, I want them to express it. I just want to know, like, why is this happening? Mm-hmm. And can we express it without the violence? And same with women. Can we express it without the pettiness? Can we express it without the, you know, and or at least if we're going to do it, say it out loud, girl. Be like, I'm going to be petty right now, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something that came to mind is um, at my last job before COVID hit, my manager, which is a woman, she would have check-ins with everyone pretty frequently. And I remember one time her and I had this one-on-one check-in where um, she brought something to my attention and she was trying to be very cordial about it, like how women tend to do. Mm -hmm. And then I was just very like blunt back. And I was like, that doesn't make sense because of ABCD. And then her eye starts twitching and I (laughs) I could tell she was holding her anger back so intensely. Um, Because everything coming out of her mouth was so nice and cordial and caring, but her eye was twitching really bad. And I was like, and in my mind, I was like, just, just say it, just say what you need to say. I didn't say that out loud, but Mm -hmm. I feel like I just kept responding how I usually respond, which is not to mimic the person across from me. And I think throughout the conversation, I saw her finally start to like be more honest. Mm. So her responses were more assertive and direct. And then we just kept talking through because I think I'm really good at still holding space in those moments and not escalating because I can understand there's ways to be assertive, maybe even emotional, but still being very direct and getting through the conversation. And then at the end of it, we kind of came to a consensus. And I think it helped that I reassured her multiple times like, oh, yeah, I agree with you. Like, um, she was kind of talking to me about how sometimes I get feedback or she gets feedback that I'm scary to customers and stuff like that. (laughs) Um, She was just like, Irene, is there a reason why customers are scared of you? And I was like, yeah, because sometimes I don't smile and Mm -hmm. I'm not in the mood to small talk and they're being unreasonable and that annoys me. And she was like, oh, okay, well, as long as you're self-aware about that. And I was like, yeah, if I'm a bitch, it's usually because they're being assholes to me. So funny. And I don't feel the need to be nice to them. And Mm -hmm. she was like, she's like, okay, well, I don't have to convince you that you're like acting a certain way because you own up to it. And then I was like, yeah, I I understand that I'm unapproachable sometimes. And she was like, okay, so we're we're in agreement here. So like, what can we do about it? And I think at the end of it, she realized that there's ways to be like confrontational, but not in a way where you're like, on separate sides, like you could still be on the same side and agree, Mm -hmm. but have confrontational type of interactions, but still have each other's best interests in mind and hear each other out. And I feel like women are so not used to doing that. Yeah. I mean, men too, in different ways. But confrontational is so I mean confrontations are so freeing in that Mm. sense Mm. if both people could hold space through all of these like messier expressions coming out and whatnot um I don't know why I shared that I forget well I think it it has to do with like okay because at the same time I'm conflict avoidant I'm not avoidant to things that are difficult yeah I'm not interested okay I remember yeah I'm not interested in things that are like so about winning or bad faith. Like I'm open with honesty and uncomfortable, but I want it to go somewhere. I don't want it to be like, you know, like I'm talking to a wall. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I feel like that comes from, there's people sometimes who want to, they want to to have a debate and they're not interested in actually listening and understanding you. There's people who, 
talk to you purely for the space for them to respond and hear themselves talk or they're wanting to talk to you with the intention of convincing you otherwise. Mm. And I feel like when people go into conversations in that way, I usually at this point in my life set a really hard boundary because like you said, when you realize that you you notice that like this isn't going to go anywhere at this point what this person wants is for me to be here and take everything from them and that's not something i want to do right and don't have to do right. and therefore you get to a point where you don't even need to explain that it's just like a i see where we are and it's just like i don't even need to respond or explain myself to this person just block right. Right. Um, and that's something I feel like I had to develop too with my channel, just seeing certain types of people commenting on my videos. Cause before I used to take it in very sincerely mm. and evaluate myself and be like, okay, does this apply? Blah, blah, blah. But I've come to realize that there's just a certain type of person that no matter what you do or say, they're not interested in actually hearing or understanding you. Mm. And if that's the case, you kind of just have to be like, why are you wanting to perceive me if mm. it makes you feel like this? Oh. Like, go put yourself in a space where you could feel an equal exchange and you could feel good about it, you know? Yeah. The other day on stream, literally, this person, I kept blocking them. They made multiple accounts called, like, other fake account. And they were basically... <clears throat> arguing with me about whether or not I can take criticism. Like, I will oh block you. I, 2024 Bernie is just going to block everybody that says anything. There's triggering words I hear, like not triggering, but like um, words I hear that are red flags. Like, um, you know, Brittany, you don't seem very open minded to people that disagree with you. Well, I know that's not true. My audience is very opinionated and we have debates and discussions all the time that are good faith. Mm -hmm. I know that's not true. So why are they saying it? And then if they say it over and over again, what they're really saying is like they're trying to like literally annoy me or they're saying like this guy came on or I'm assuming it's a man because of the way they typed, but that could be wrong, where they said like, you're not a therapist. Why are you pretending to be a therapist? I was like, never said I was a therapist, not a therapist. This is not a mental yeah. health channel. This is a philosophy channel. And yeah. and then they were like, yeah, but you pretend to be a therapist. I was like, OK, block. Mm -hmm. You know for a fact I'm not pretending to be a therapist. I've disclaimed, mm -hmm. disclaimed, disclaimed. So if you're going to come in bad faith and be like, you're pretending to be one, that is not even in any way true, block. It's not my fault. I'm being perceived as a therapist because like nobody knows what therapy is. Dr. K had that happen yesterday in chat. People were like, this is like therapy. He's like, this is not like therapy. And I was like, everyone thinks being seen is therapy. Oh, I understand you. Oh, this is like therapy. Oh, like you really get me. Therapy. None of that is therapy. <laughs> like that is not what therapy is. And like it, those elements exist in therapy. Those elements also exist in relationships. Those elements exist at work. Those elements exist at church. So it's interesting when people don't even know like what therapy is. So they'll watch my channel and say that. But anyways, it's like I know that I can't engage with these things. So I just block people. If people come yeah. at and write things in chat like – um, just things that are just slanderous versus like open-minded block. But if people come in and go, hey, girl, new to the content, not sure what this means. Could you explain it? I'm like, oh, mm. thank you for giving me this opportunity. Because two, two things. It allows me to express how my brain works. And two, if new people are also in the audience and see the question, now they can go to that question and see me answer it. So sometimes I do answer people that are even slightly like negative, but in hopes that other people will see it. Because if one person is thinking it, 10 people are thinking it. So I'm like, oh, okay. Like just this is for everybody. But all of that has to do with like the boundaries I've set for myself in terms of engaging. Because if I engage with too many people, not only will my frustration grow to anger, but my anger will be just not, not conducive or efficient with like aiming for my goals or my keeping my joy and my peace. Mm -hmm. Like ultimately, I love sadness, but not if it's getting in the way of my joy. I love anger, yeah. but not if it's getting in the way of my joy. I love happiness, but not if it's getting in the way of my joy. And these things are mm -hmm. different to me. And so mm -hmm. I think ultimately when I think about anger, I think of it as like a tool and an expression of emotion that sometimes mm -hmm. happens whether I like it or not. And it's my job yeah. to have a good relationship with it. Emotions should move you through hardships and pop you out on the other end. Mm. 
if it's not doing that and it's weighing you down and keeping you from moving, then mm -hmm. that's an indication that there's something that needs to change there, you know? Um, oh, there's so much that came to mind when you were just saying all of that. Hmm. I feel like it's so, it feels very violating when you're just existing and concentrating on yourself and not projecting on others, more or less. Mm. And someone takes you from that place of self-expression and like p tries to put you into like a bubble mm. and force you into a narrative and project all these misinterpretations onto you. I feel like that's so violating because it's like now you you're put in a weird position where you have to convince them otherwise just to be simply put back into that bubble that you were initially in. Yeah. Um and that it's just not fair in a sense where it just kind of takes away agency. And I feel like that kind of comes the whole exchange that happens with people like that is that they're just not curious. They're not willing to actually hear what you have to say and understand you. Um, they're kind of listening to hear certain words to reinforce a narrative that they've already made up in their head and are convinced that it is true. I feel like a good indication that someone is allowing you to exist in your own plane is that they if they don't understand you, they ask questions to understand you. Yeah. Yeah. And it shows, like I can hear it in their tonality of when they're actually interested and when they're just yeah. trying to cast judgment. Even the other day, my mom and I had a really great moment where she was like, well, if you guys had kids, where would they go to school? And I was like, just a reminder that we're 99% not having children. She was like, no, no, I know that. I was just curious, like, what would you do? And I was like, oh, that's a great question because I think about that all the time. Like, if I did have kids, where would they be? And I felt like a real tonality shift in her where instead of, like, previously judging us for maybe not having kids, she was, like, actually just curious on, like, but what would you do if you did? And it was, like, a very fun conversation and we had a great mm -hmm. time. But I know I've, like, spent my life trying to, like, think well of people and trying to assume that they are actually interesting or interested in what they're asking me, but also be prepared for the people that are like trying to trap you because mm -hmm. there are those people that are, especially in online communities, they are trying to like, gotcha. And I'm like, Oh, this feels bad. Like when we're trying to get each other, you know what I mean? Even that I think is a unhealthy form of, anger, mm. expression, projection, and always needing to constantly view other people from that critical lens of needing to convince them out of their opinions or way of existing and convince them that it's wrong. Mm. Like, if you genuinely have a good relationship with yourself, you can understand why everyone is the way that they are, even if you don't agree with it. And you feel comfortable giving them, them a space to just be them. Mm. And you know how to set certain boundaries for yourself, knowing that knowledge, right? Like, let's say there's a person and you're like, okay, that, that person's this way. Um, they're not a bad person, but I don't necessarily get along with them. I'm going to let them exist how they want to. That just means like, I don't really want to talk to them as often. Right. Because um, I don't necessarily interact well with them instead of just putting so much time and energy in trying to show them why they're wrong like oh I, I need this person to realize how annoying they are for sure it's just like it it's so much energy directed so unproductively and I think that's another part of it as people who can kind of intellectualize subjective experiences you get to a point you're where you're just like the way that you are writing your statement is an, an indication of your thought processes and I can't work with that. Mm. So this is no longer an equal exchange and I'm not, ex I'm not interested in having an, an equal exchange, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think ultimately, regardless of the relationship we're all having with our emotions, but specifically anger, 
Like we have to do the work to understand why and how and and decide what to do with that, right? Mm-hmm. Like I can't – like I can't go to my friend who has anger issues or like an issue with – when I say anger issues, I mean like a relationship with anger that isn't the healthiest. Okay. When I When I go to them and I have that conversation with them and they're struggling to see or deal with it, even though they know it's a problem, I can't do it for them. Mm-hmm. they have to do it. So all I can do is be supportive and like give them a thumbs up when I see they're making progress and like tell them it's going to be okay even when they're not like because I know I see them working on it. And same with me. It's not like I can expect people to worry about myself, like me, my issues, like I have to figure them out. It's just about having that appropriate relationship with the people around us. And I think when it gets inappropriate is when it comes and becomes our issue. Like, again, my husband and I are married. His shit is not my shit. My shit's not his shit. Like, we Mm -hmm. support each other. We're each other's, like, cheerleaders. But we don't – I don't say, like, here's my thing. Here's my fibro. Fix it. Deal Mm -hmm. with it. It's like, well, he's not the one with fibro. Yeah. That doesn't mean that he's not the one making my ice packs, that he's not the one getting me tea, that he's not the one like, do you need something? Can I get you anything? That's him Mm -hmm. being supportive, but it's not him dealing with my fibro. That's me. And Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to make him have to deal with that because talk about frustration, dealing with a chronically ill body that like refuses to fucking function. And you're just like, I'm so frustrated. But like, I that's not him. And I think that's the hardest part for everyone right now is we all have to deal with the fact that we are putting our shit on other people. Um, and then we we hopefully learn not to. But that that took me 30 years. 30 mm-hmm. years to learn not to put my shit on other people. Mm-hmm. Everyone's like going to have to figure it out in their own time. You know what I mean? I feel like it's both sides that – I feel like – I feel like society is so black and white in a sense where we're either taking – everyone else's shit on as our own Mm -hmm. or we idealize individualism too much where there's this idea that we have to be at this specific level of performance and perfection to be worthy of relationships yeah like I see in the mental health space this idea of like you need to cut off that friend who's always venting to you or always having a hard time you know things like that Um, And that's a whole complex type of, you know, interplay. But there's an aspect of like, are we allowed to struggle as humans and still have our relationships? Because not everyone's going to have a perfect life Mm. where they're constantly like mentally stable. There's going to be times where we are really struggling. And how can we have a safe space to struggle without feeling like our friends are taking it on and being like, this is too much. I can't be friends with you anymore Mm -hmm. type of a thing. Like how can they still make space for you to struggle knowing that you will find a way out of it eventually, or if you need help from them, you will ask for it Mm -hmm. and they don't have to take that emotional weight on and process it for you. Right. Um, Cause I kind of talked about how like, I don't know if I'm using the right language. I said like far left culture and a lot of people were correcting me in my comments saying that that's not accurate, but I don't know. But I've been kind of just talking about how like the far left culture is almost like purity culture repackaged, Mm. but with a lot of mental health terms, Um, you know, saying things like don't use these words because it invalidates another person. And it could just be the question of like, you know, it it could just be a statement like, oh, um, this will pass by eventually. Like, you won't feel like this forever. You know, things like that. People are like, don't use that phrasage because it invalidates. Or like, even needing to preface everything with a trigger warning. Mm. There's times where I'm like, the need to almost control other people because you can't navigate your own internal issues and world, I feel like is kind of, um, it's, it's kind of like purity culture Mm. almost. I think it's the black and whiteness. I think no matter what, anytime you're dealing with black and white in such a nuanced, 
arena, it feels weird. It's like when you say trauma around certain conservatives and they go, ugh. And it's the same way with like needing, like, look, sometimes I love our trigger warning. Sometimes it's unnecessary. Sometimes people overuse trauma. Sometimes it's appropriate. I feel like, yeah. again, this is my brain. I just want to categorize everything appropriately. So I'm going to be like, what category of human am I talking to? So I know how to change my language or speak to them in a way that makes sense to them. Or I can choose to speak like myself and get ready for the conflict. Because like the conflict arises. Like even yesterday in my chat, they were like discussing the R word and whether it's a slur. And like what is a slur? Is it objective? Where does it come from? Culture, like humans made it up and we put it in this category. And like people are saying it's objective and things are subjective. And I'm like, we don't even know what those words mean. And so I think like ultimately there's so much more nuance to be had, especially around things like emotions or experience mm -hmm. or perception. That ultimately, that's why I think the world is like these like beautiful bubbles that like morph into one another or separate into more bubbles or like they pop sometimes or they reconstruct in different shapes. And I think ultimately like it matters which one we're involving ourselves with. And that's why I say like there's a flavor of toxic masculinity anger that I don't feel safe around. And then there's mm -hmm. a level of like masculine men who are angry that I feel more than comfortable around, you know, because like they're different things. But people might think because they're hearing me talk, think they're the same thing. It's like the people that hear toxic masculinity and think that you mean masculinity is toxic when that's mm -hmm. like not what that means. Mm -hmm. But I can see why they think it's what it means. Yeah. You know, and same thing with like how people say like don't use this language or even recently I've been covering a lot of subjects where there's a part of the Internet that's like, oh, I can't believe you just said that. And I was like, oh, I can't believe you. You just said that. And then yeah. we're sitting there like pointing like the Spider-Man meme where it's like. And that's ultimately what it is like, why do you, what, how do you feel about that? Again, diversity brings chaos and may it come swiftly. Like if we want diversity, we're going to need chaos. So this idea that like I want diversity with peace, I don't even know where you got that was possible. There's no data to show that. Like I just have no data. <laughs> so I'm here for it. Bring out the diversity, bring out the different ways we're going to have relationships, but like that's what we're dealing with here. It's like the nuance of how different we all are. I feel like what it comes down to is when we start to move away from controlling each other mm -hmm. and more towards allowing each other to coexist because we have tools to navigate conflict resolution, mm -hmm. that is when we will understand each other more and have less of these unhealthy coping mechanisms that are either way too aggressive or way too mm -hmm. passive aggressive. Um, like instead of like instead of saying trigger warning every single time you're about to talk about something sensitive, just prefacing it by encouraging the other person to check in with themselves and giving them the option to speak up whenever they do feel uncomfortable, but also giving them the space to surprise themselves with the fact that they aren't uncomfortable, mm. I think is a, another part of it. Like. I can understand in an aspect this idea of like, oh, people are too sensitive nowadays, where there's times where I think humans are a lot more capable of processing really difficult emotions and conversations. And even to an extent, even if they're triggered, it's important to still navigate and explore those topics that trigger you. Mm. So like, how do we, instead of avoiding all the time, get to a place where we can understand when we're uncomfortable and what we want to do about it? Do we want to navigate through it in a safe way or do we want to stop it and, you know, choose another time that's better for you to navigate it? Um, mm. Cause just not, not dealing with it altogether because you're sensitive to it isn't helpful, but also avoiding it um, in a way where you're not even aware that it bothers you is also not helpful, you know? That's so funny because, like, uh, I realized something on you. I had, I had a, an epiphany with my chat the other day mm -hmm. where when I say triggered, uh, depending on the context, I mostly mean medically triggered, mm -hmm. not just, like, upset. So I okay. realized like I got to be careful about that because the internet uses trigger as like I am upset. Oh, I'm, I like, see. I have to be careful about that personally because like example is like I was triggered on stream once. I called into someone's stream. Mm -hmm. And I, when I told them I was triggered, I meant medically triggered. Yeah. I didn't mean I was upset. I yeah. meant I was – my brain was like I'm back in that like bad place. And I'm yeah. calling into stream to be like, hey, you can't – you don't do that. And it was my PTSD was triggered. 
And now I'm having an epiphany of like, when I say that, are people thinking that I'm saying I'm simply upset? Mm -hmm. Because though being upset is valid, that's not what's happening. So like a trigger warning wasn't for people who were upset. It was for people that might trigger their PTSD or trigger their trauma or actually be literally triggered. And I've seen on my Discord, like people will get triggered and I'll see that they are in no way like actually they don't – they'll like attack people. And on my Discord, you're allowed to get triggered without punishment because we know it's like a medical – we know it's serious. But if I notice someone's being like a kind of a bitch, like they're being upset, and I'm like, hey, don't be mean because you have your feelings hurt. Okay? You can have your feelings hurt, but don't be mean. Or if someone's triggered, I'm like, hey, no big deal. Walking away is self-care. Even on my own stream, I'm like, reminder that walking away is self-care, saying, Brittany, I need to actually like piece out of this. I covered a, a topic on neurodivergency like I don't even know a month ago. Mm -hmm. And people were like, oh, my God, I got to like piece out of this conversation. And I was like, cool. I'll see you for next one. And then as is the – that the Jubilee video? Maybe. I think so. And even okay. for myself as a content creator, I have to remember that it's not about me that they need to walk away. Yeah. Because I don't want to get defensive on my end and be like, what the fuck? Why are you walking away? What, you can't handle it? And I've seen that from people in the space where they think it's about them. Mm -hmm. So honestly, like, again, I don't mind trigger warnings as long as we understand why they're there. I don't mind people mm -hmm. using the word trigger as long as we understand how the context we're using it in. I don't mind if you're upset as long as we know why we're up. Like, I don't mind anything as long as we know why it's happening and we can move through it. But mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's asking a lot of people right now outside of smaller communities. Look, this even happens on one-on-one -on -one stuff, like with parents or family or friends. Like we don't perfectly communicate. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we get angry. We don't perfectly communicate. So sometimes we're sad. We don't perfectly communicate. So sometimes we get defensive. I don't want perfection. I just want resolution, which will take time. Maybe not even in this lifetime. Um with that said, I'm dwindling on spoons just a bit and I have a stream coming up. So I wanted to ask okay. you, um, cause I know we could talk forever. Like genuinely this happens every time we end up talking, we just like, we could just bounce ideas off forever, mm -hmm. but I want to make sure that we've covered things that you had in mind today. I want you to finish whatever thought you just wrote down, but I want to give it to you to kind of like, um, you know, wrap us up any thoughts, other ideas you want to explore. Um, just like a really quick add on to that topic that we were talking about just now. Um, I say that because I was surprised the past two years because I work one on one with clients and there's a, I think all my clients are liberal people, right? I feel like I'm liberal too. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my clients was in this like group that was talking about the whole purpose of the group is to talk about and process together all these social issues, right? Mm. And on the outside, theoretically, it sounds great. I was like, oh, that's so interesting navigating these really difficult conversations, blah, blah, blah. And what ended up happening, what actually ended up happening within this group is that there was all of these social dynamics that was basically controlling what each other was supposed to talk about and express. Mm -hmm. So for example, if someone were to be like, hey, can I talk about the crimes being inflicted on Asians and whatever? Um, blah, blah, blah. This is how it's impacting me. And then after the group is over, people are just like, just so you know, you didn't warn us that you're going to talk about that. And it triggered me. And that's mm -hmm. not okay. Like you in the future need to like preface these things and blah, blah, blah. Um, and basically, it is just kind of interesting that I feel like people's inability to speak up for themselves in moments of discomfort, uh, comfort, ends up coming out in ways where you're over controlling over other people and how they sure. speak for and sure. how you basically displace the responsibility on them to manage your emotions for you. How, how white of them? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Surprisingly, this group was people of color and yeah. in the LGBTQ space. Yeah. It, it, but how so, normal, how normal. That's what I'm saying. Like the self-righteousness in us needs to be, I, this is where I think philosophy comes in. What is your belief about the world and what you're doing here? Because your desire to have attachment in controlling people and your environment is, in my opinion, like furthest from joy. Because you're, you're, again, you're obsessed with that control, which I think is just coming from a place of fear and trauma. Yeah. Yeah. You know I what mean, I mean? Yeah. Yeah. 
I the mean, irony, honestly, though. Mm -hmm. the displacement of responsibility and the inability to take accountability, I think, comes from just how you are interacting with your own trauma, basically. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, in that moment, I almost want to ask them, were you medically triggered or are you upset? Do you mean I feel like they would consider themselves medically triggered. Well, then just in that because case, that their therapist should have taught them that that means that this is a boundary time for you. You cannot put your triggers. That's like a military soldier being like, you can't do fireworks because it triggers me. And now you're doing it on purpose because it's 4th of July and you're hurting me. Versus oh, yeah. let's be considered as a community that this soldier might hear a firework and get triggered. So let's put signs in the yards. Let's get people prepared. Let's move as a community. But the soldier wouldn't put the blame on the community for celebrating 4th of July. Mm -hmm. Right. They would say, OK, this is a this is my brain malfunctioning in some capacity. Mm -hmm. Let's see what I can do to also be a good community member. It's not like mm -hmm. people are doing it on purpose. It's not like they're like, <laughs> you know who I'm going to trigger today? Soldiers, bro. It's not like. Yeah. But, and same with these groups is they have to understand like people aren't maliciously targeting you. They're like, no, they're like, doop, 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 doop. Who can I trigger today? Some people are. And those people have their own neuroses they got to deal with in therapy or whatever. But mm -hmm. generally speaking, especially if you're going to like a group setting for support, they're not trying to make you upset. They're trying to express their own frustration, which, by the yeah. way, is why I don't do good in group activities. I don't like group. I didn't do group therapy personally. I did solo therapy. I remember when my therapist is like, do you want to do group DBT? And I was like, do you want me to die? Mm -hmm. I was like, I do not want to sit in a room full of people like all arguing about they're like, no, I want to talk to you. I want to pay you. I want you to help me. I'll pay mm -hmm. you extra if that's what it takes. It didn't. But. I was like, I do not want to work with people because I love people. But no matter who it is, even the best intentioned people together become a mob, mm -hmm. in my opinion. It's weird. I agree with you. There's something about when you get a group of people together, it's almost like there's a brainwashing that happens. You have and it's to. So, it's so interesting when yeah. it happens. Mm -hmm. I think you have to like a school of fish because you have to move together. So yeah. any deviation is like, what are you doing? You're fucking up the formation. <laughs> so I can't even blame them. I, I oh, really can't. Yeah. But I, I yeah. really think it's simp as simple as like, you're ruining the formation. And it's like, yeah. Which is what the confusing part of how society ends up managing itself. And I think it manages itself by like, when I go to the grocery store, we all agree this is how we're going to act. When I come back to my home, oh, I, I let it all go. Mm -hmm. And it's like that's the part where people can't decide how much of the part of me that wants to let go should be in public. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the like the society you have, right? It depends on how you mm -hmm. want to manage these things. But yeah, mm -hmm. I really do think that's the conflict we all have to accept is like communities move together or there's conflict. Do, have you heard the controversy with the Queer Eye guys who as a group – Little bits, yeah. They all look like they get along but secretly there's a lot of infighting and a lot of – because like – Ultimately, look, not all good people are going to get along. If the whole world was peaceful, if the whole world went to therapy, if the whole world got philosophy, if the whole world was enlightened, we'd all find ways to create conflict because we're not always going to get along. The best, most wonderful humans aren't going to get along. And that's just the reality. So, like, why do you and I get along? I don't know. But, like, I love it. I don't know, but I love it. And I think a part of it is just like we're curious in similar ways probably. We're open-minded in similar ways. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot that goes into this. But, you know, it doesn't mean that because we're good people, we're going to get along with all other good people or they're good people, so they're going to get along with us. Like, and I think that's the difficult thing to radically accept. I feel like there's a certain level of consciousness where you will respect another person even if – you're not like them or agree mm -hmm. with them. And it, it kind of goes down to like you allowing other people to take up their own space in their way. Mm. And it doesn't have to threaten yourself in any sort of capacity. Um, Cause honestly, when you get to that mm -hmm. sort of peace, you actually like seeing people be different for mm -hmm. me. Like when I see people with different, different viewpoints, my mentality isn't to, think about, oh, she said something or he said something and I don't agree with it. And that frustrates me and I need to go like argue with them about it. For me, it's like, oh, that's really interesting that they said that. And then I put myself in their shoes and I, I view it from their point of view. And I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's interesting. And then I kind of just like, if I don't resonate with it, I just leave it 
on the side after mm. I process it and move on. But like, e- other than that, it, it has nothing to do with me in a sense, mm. you know? Go ahead. Finish your thought. Um, And kind of going back to what you were talking about with conflict, I feel like conflict will always be there. Even if you're a good person, you will still have conflict with others and with yourself. It's more about finding ways to have proper conflict resolution. Yeah. Like when we're all mad at each other or upset or someone messes up, which is bound to happen. Mm -hmm. Like how do we honestly talk through it and how it impacted us without feeling like we're going to fight and um, isolate the person or like black sheep them Mm. like how do we actually talk through it and find a resolution there you know yeah and okay I'll say this for my final and then I'll throw it to you and then we'll end things okay here's the benefit of where I'm at in my life versus before now when I'm angry I'm not angry at the consciousness I'm upset that I am having a conflict with what I'm observing so I recognize that I am angry at a person, even though I can radically accept that that's their journey and that's who they are. And this has nothing to do with me. And if I find myself being angry, the anger is with myself. I'm saying, oh, I am angry. I am no longer angry at that person. I'm not pointing fingers at that person. Before I would be like, I'm angry at you, but it's not even them. When I'm angry, I notice I'm angry with a part of myself that won't accept them for who they are. I want them to change what they won't. Or I'm just like upset that I won't understand them. So it, ultimately it has to do with me. Mm-hmm. I am the creation, the arbiter, the magician behind my anger. And I have to have the relationship with it. So often I think people are still in the stage of being angry at people, blaming people, pointing fingers at people, which is so fine. But hopefully you don't stay there. Hopefully you don't continue to blame people for just being people. Hopefully you learn to have a relationship with boundaries within the consciousness yourself to say like, I recognize you're on your own journey. I'm on mine. I hope our conflict is always just this. And I hope it's never, God forbid, like face to face, gun to gun or sword to sword or in a war setting. But I hope that our conflict is always a matter of like, I choose to disengage. But obviously, like though I am frustrated, I recognize this is a relationship I'm having with myself. Mm-hmm. you know good luck buddy but like you know what I mean and this is outside the bounds of this is a philosophy conversation this is outside the bounds of like the law or society or like the ideal this is the ex- mm-hmm. this is a conversation about letting go of that attachment mm-hmm. for the sake of yourself you know mm-hmm. and I think that will in the long run add more positivity to the world like more actual joy okay I'll throw it to you yeah I feel like that whole dynamic is it kind of goes hand in hand with developing trust to the outside world, Mm. which I think can only happen when you develop that, that sort of stability in yourself, because you trust that no matter what happens internally or externally, you will be able to navigate it if you have a good relationship with yourself and you can regulate yourself. Um, And I also feel like part of that trust comes from actually understanding the other person. Like if you genuinely approach people from the standpoint of wanting to understand them, even if you don't agree and even if you still come to the consensus of like, I don't know if I like that, like that's not okay. You won't necessarily be angry because you can understand why they arrived Mm. at that point. And you understand that you have no control over them. Right. And so therefore you trust that they will navigate that the way that they need to, because that's their thing. And that, you know, you're just kind of like someone that is witnessing that journey. Um, And of course, if you're still attached to others in a codependent way where you're like, my my good is your good, your bad is my bad. Mm. It's going to be hard to do that because you don't have that stable relationship with yourself in the world around you. Um, so I feel like your relationship with anger will transform in all different parts of your life. I feel like even repressed anger is a part of that journey of alchemy to mm. getting to the point where you could feel like you could express your anger healthily and hold space for other people's anger because I feel like repressed anger is just that first initial step to taking accountability for yourself and learning how to develop that internal system in processing that anger. And I feel like once you've developed that 
you could kind of move into the step of trusting that you could express it in a healthy way that doesn't harm others or yourself and things like that. Absolutely. Um, and that all comes with, I mean, the understanding for others all comes from your understanding of yourself. So like if I'm moving through that, I can now understand when other people are moving through that same mm -hmm. process and therefore mm -hmm. I don't have to judge them. It's more like, a, oh, I see where you're at right now. And therefore, like, that's it. There's no yep. like judgment. It's just like, I see where you're at right now mm -hmm. type of a thing, mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Irene, thank you so much for a lovely <laughs> conversation. I'll go ahead and link your channel down below. I really okay. appreciated you talking to me. I actually think this is going to be a killer podcast. You know, this is going to be good. Yeah. I mean, either way, I think this is fun. And, you know, if you ever want to invite me back on for any other subjects, I'd be so happy to come on and talk. I would love that. And you guys, like, if you guys um, are done watching the podcast and you've reached this point in the conversation, please let us know in the comment sections down below if you'd like us to make a podcast again, because I think we have such good flow and I would just love to talk to you again. So I will take suggestions in the comment sections. Yes, All right, yes. girly, I will reach out to you again soon. Have a great day and we will see you guys next podcast. Bye. Bye. In my head, in real life while I'm dead My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah Sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool. Dun, dun.